Over to you. Everybody, gear me now. Please take it away. Okay, thanks, Ri and Ari, because like for this amazing initiative, I think it's a really nice way to bring together the community. And then I was really honored that you would invite me to give one of these talks because I feel like, you know, my life story with science is rather short, as you will know. So I will, but hopefully some of you will find it interesting. And then I will start at the beginning, just because, you know, I said it's rather short. I haven't been doing science for that long, although it feels like it's been a long while. So this is me today. You can, this is basically the information you can find in my lab website. I just started my group at Brandeis and I'm interested in understanding what I call living patterns. So how different things in biology, specifically in the context of low generation by ciliary arrays are able to generate the centimeter scale patterns by putting together micrometer scale units. So in this map, you can see where the lab is, is Waltham, pretty close to Boston. And for me, it was really nice to be able to come back to Boston because I've been everywhere and then life kind of went full circle for me. So I was actually born in Boston. And then here are a couple of pictures you can see. So these are my parents and me. And this picture is actually, I used to, my parents used to live a couple of blocks from where I live now. So it's really, really full circle for me. But I, my life started in Boston, but I grew far away from Boston, grew up far away from Boston. So actually I was born in Boston because my dad is a physics professor. So he was doing his PhD at Northeastern, but then his PhD was over, grad school was over. So we all went back to Mexico and I was four. So I grew up, I spent my entire childhood and like my adult life initially in Mexico. And then here you can see a picture of my dad in his office. And then my mom is a social worker, so she couldn't be more different, but you know, they both were working all the time. And then I grew up with a couple of brothers and then here you can see them. So this is the context of where I grew up, which is really far from where I started. And, and people always the story of like how they love science or how they were first interested in science. And for me, Kind of having a dad that was a scientist made me feel the opposite way. I like had I didn't want I didn't want anything to do with science ever. I was like, oh, I love books, I love reading. Here you can see a picture of me at this book fair that happens every February in Mexico City. If you're ever there and have a chance to go, it's amazing. It's so so big, and then you just get lost looking at books. So then I love reading, and I had this idea: okay, I'm gonna study literature. I'm gonna do philosophy, something like that, all the way through like the end of high school. But ironically, there were some books that actually changed my life or my career choice. And there were these books. In high school, I was, um, yeah, I was like always good at school. So then they were like, oh, why don't you participate in this like Olympiads that they have in math and physics and whatever. So I was like, sure, why not? But I was like never really into math or anything. But for this Olympiads, you had to go to special classes and special trainings. And then you would solve problems from these books. And this is kind of where I was like, oh my God, I can't believe math is so beautiful and pretty. And then I started really getting into it just from simple proofs, right? So all these are like simple combinatorics, geometry, but I love proofs. Like to me, the logic of math was just really appealing. Like, okay, I have A, B, and then C, and then what can I deduce from that? I can create a whole universe and it's like all logical and self-consistent. So after that, I was like, okay, this is too hard. I will have to study something that is like related to math. So then that's when I like, Forget, forgot about my ambitions to be a philosopher or a writer. Although, you know, that's still plan B all the time. <laughs> but then after realizing I really like math and I really, I, what I really liked was the logic, I decided to study physics because I thought maybe jumping into math that is so abstract is not the, like, you know, the best thing, but physics is like really heavily into math, but it's more about the world, so why not? And here I'm showing you a picture of where I studied physics. So I studied physics at UNAM. So I wanna give you some context because I perhaps had a very different undergraduate experience than most people. So UNAM is this giant monster public university in Mexico City. So I actually pay like 10 cents of a Mexican peso to go to school every semester. But then it's, a really, it's really, really competitive to get into it. 
you get all these applications from all the people all across Mexico. But then once you're in, you get a really, really good education, right? Because you have lots of researchers, like 80% of Mexico's research comes out of NAM. But also it's a very special place. So in this picture here, you can see some demonstration about something because it's always, since it's autonomous from the government, it's always linked to political causes and social causes. So like you are growing up in this academic atmosphere, but you're always influenced by all this like principles of social justice and like criticizing the government, et cetera. So it's very different. And then here you can see some pictures from that time. You know, this is like what the School of Sciences looked like. You have a school that is like separate. Since there's so many students, science is separate. You have math, biology, physics, and I think computer science. And then this is kind of what the buildings look like. And you always had to do a senior thesis as an undergraduate there. So I really wanted to do research, but then problem was that you can't do lab work in Mexico as a physicist. There's of course very low funding. So everything is theoretical. And I was like, no, but I wanna like do something with my hands, do experiments. So then I was like, okay, might as well just go to the neighboring institute. So this is the Institute for Cellular Physiology because people, you know, they seem to have labs. And, but then I had no idea of, you know, so what a cell was. I couldn't tell a cell from a protein or, you know, what's the difference because education is so specialized. I took all these math courses, physics courses. I knew nothing about biology. But then I was really lucky to meet Tamara Rosenbaum. So she told me like, ah, you know, my husband always says like, he wishes he had studied physics and he studies ion channels. So I have no room for you in my lab, but why don't you go talk to him? Maybe he'll find something for you to do. And then I actually, this was like a complete lucky stroke. And then I started working in Neil Isis, this lab. So he, he did electrophysiology and he studied voltage gated ion channels. And this is what's kind of my entry to biophysics. And then I didn't realize, but even from the beginning, I always liked this idea of having two advisors. So. I was working in the lab, in Leon Isles' lab, but then I was also working with Tim Minsoni, who is an applied mathematician, who was an applied mathematician. He sadly passed away in 2017. But then we were trying to create all these models of like charge screening in ion channels and whether this would have an effect on the opening or gating of these channels. So then always from the beginning, I kind of just had this like tool advisor thing going on. I could just, cause it seemed like I would be missing one piece all the time. And then this is where I really was like, okay, like I know nothing about biology, but like there's so many open questions. So here I met Andres Jara Oseguera. I think he's now a postdoc at NIH, but he was a grad student in Leon's lab. And then we would just like chat for forever. And then like, he was like so generous with his time and like with everything, answering all these questions I always had. Cause I had no idea what was going on. And then I would be like, oh, what do you think of this? And he's like, oh, we actually don't know the answer. So I was like, wait, there's so many unknowns in biophysics. It seems like- You hear me now? Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but this yeah. is one minute morning. Yep. Okay. So then that got me into biophysics and I ended up applying to grad school and Margaret and then at U Chicago and joining Margaret's group. So of course, Margaret has all this energy and enthusiasm that pulled me to her lab. And then the idea was that we would study collective cell migration just because there was this paper. This was like a topic that was new back then. And I would collaborate with this lab to study that study collective cell migration in egg chambers. Uh, the problem was that in the end, this ended up not being a great model for studying collective cell migration. So my grad school project ended up being something completely different. But here I met Maureen Satera, who's about to open her lab next summer. And then she's an amazing developmental biologist. So she greatly influenced who I was and then the research I do. And then in the Gerdel lab, I also had the luck to work with Patrick Oakes, who also has his own lab now. And he's like an amazing biophysicist. Like, you know, I learned a lot of things from Margaret, but day to day, I would just like talk to Patrick all the time, discuss everything, you know, he taught me how to culture cells. And then we would just like write mil a million things on the board and discuss things. And here are just some pictures of the times I had in the Gerdel lab. And then you could see I was a fan of making liquid nitrogen ice cream. And then I just wanna mention briefly that I had the fortune of attending during grad school, the MBL physiology course, which is the summer course that everyone talks about that you go to Woods Hole, spend your entire summer 
And then you meet all the scientists from all over the world that are like physicists, biologists, all over the place. And this is where I met Wallace Marshall. So Wallace Marshall is gonna play a very important role later because uh, just for personal reasons, after finishing my PhD, I had to move to the Bay Area. And there looking for postdocs, I like, asked like, I interviewed in a bunch of labs, but in the end I asked Wallace and Manu like, hey, do you think you could hire me as a joint postdoc? Because again, I felt like having two advisors would be the best thing for me. And then they were like, sure, why not? And then we were like, okay, what are you gonna study? And then we were like, oh, why don't you study cilia? That was like the thing. And then we were like, sure, why don't I study cilia? So then that's what I ended up like being into like this three year exploration of all this milieu model organisms. And then like hanging out with all these amazing scientists. So these are just some pictures from Manu's lab. And then there you have really like people from very different backgrounds. And then we, we the conversations and just the growth as a scientist that I had was incredible. Same goes for Wallace's lab because I was part of both of these amazing groups that like were full of people with so many ideas that greatly influenced me and how I do research now. And here I wanna highlight two scientists that like had a very big influence on what I do is research wise now. Scott Cole, who just opened his lab at the University of Madison in Wisconsin and Ben Larson, who I briefly overlapped with in Wallace's lab. So they both love protists and then they and then Ben also does a lot of evolutionary biology so then they really made me appreciate like all these different things that kind of open up new possibilities for what I would do and then I would just want to end this talk by thanking my three advisors like really I locked out completely it was completely a random balk what led me to them like I never planned you know this is going to be my path it was like completely random and circumstantial that I ended up in their labs, but I could have not been luckier. Like Margaret is just amazing. I learned so much from her. She has like an unbelievable enthusiasm and she's so sharp with things. Like she would not like let me say something that was even a little slightly wrong. And to this day, I find myself like being like, okay, why am I doing this experiment? What is my hypothesis? Like. So all of that is like thanks to her. And then Wallace and Manu were like the contrast. So in this case, it, I, like I spent my postdoc doing exploratory research completely because they were always so excited about, about this, about that. Then I think that balance of those two different things like really influence what I do today. And then I wanna end just by showing you like a few images of, that highlight what I'm doing today. So it has elements of everything and everyone that I just told you about. So it has this elements of studying developmental systems that I learned from Maureen. I incorporated the protists and the evolutionary angle uh, to understand ciliary arrays in the context of these cells that I learned from Scott and from Ben, and then always linked it to the cell biology, which is of course very tied to what Patrick does right now. So I feel like I've been very fortunate and that like now the research I do really draws inspiration from all of these things. And then it's really, I think, uh, the interface, some of the questions are more physics, some of the questions are more biology, but I feel like I never realized until I put together this talk that that's kind of my personality and that's how it's always been like. I like chaos, I guess it comes from living in Mexico City. So then this is kind of the perfect research and it somehow was like self-organized. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Guillermino. Uh, we'll take two more questions and then off you go to your next breakout session. You want to un unmute and ask anybody? Come on, you all. So uh, I had a question about the active carpets in mm -hmm. your last slide. <laughs> Would you that? tell us what this is about? Uh, so the active carpets is basically if this is a speak for a ciliary array. Right? Oh, so okay. The array of cilia is an active carpet uh, to the array of cilia. Cool. <laughs> One more burning question. All right. Then we have food for conversation in the breakout sessions. Off you go, and then you come back to Ken's talk. 